Welcome to this introduction to MATLAB. Uh, my name is Kevin Mormon, and I'm a lecturer at NUI Galway in, in Ireland. Um, I will be talking to you about MATLAB, introducing the basic principles. I'm going to talk first about creating variables, running scripts, what, what they look like, how you can organize them with uh, comments and uh, cell structures in the code, and how you can create, um, um, well, first of all, variables, then arrays and matrices. And then the key trick in MATLAB is indexing. So how do you index into arrays and matrices and different um, uh, components? And um, then I'm going to talk to you about three forms of indexing. So there's um, linear indexing, subscript indexing, and logic indexing. So those are the three forms and how to use those. And then to see, can I introduce um, for loops as well as while loops, if statements, and switch statements. And then I'm going to end with some material on plotting and in particular to plot a patch, which could visualize a, a mesh of some sort or a grid. Okay, so that's what I'll be talking about. And what you see on the screen here is what you could see typically if you open MATLAB. Now I'm using a Linux system, so on Windows or Mac it might look a little bit different. And I'm using MATLAB release 2021A, um, but you might have a different version. Um, anyway, on the left you could see, uh, I'll use my mouse to highlight it, is the command window. Okay, on the right, workspace. That configuration might look a bit different for you. You can drag these windows to different places. Um, it can be a bit fiddly to position them in, in a different place. So if you want it down there, for instance, you can put it there. Okay, so it could look different for you. I'm going to put it back. Oops, I took taking it out. See how fiddly it is? Dock and put it back to the left. Come on. There. Oh. All right. <laughs> I should edit this bit out of the video. But actually, this could be good feedback for my lab to make it uh, make it easier to use. I think it's in there now. Great. Okay, we're back. So on the left is our command window, on the right is the command, uh, sorry, the workspace. Um, let's start by just using MATLAB as a plain, silly calculator, right? So you can say A equals 1. First thing you see on the right is that in the workspace, it is sort of the current memory of the computer. We've stored a variable called A. There's a little grid-like symbol, which is the symbol for an array. Um, and uh, so that denotes what type of variable it is. It is of the class double. Its size is 1 by 1, because it's just one element and its value is one okay great let's create another one b equals two there now we have another variable and it takes eight bytes uh, to store that in your computer if we add these two together we know that answer has to be three if i just do that here it's kind of like a calculator oops sorry and the answer is um is three and it, br it briefly stores a variable called ans as the answer maybe it's more useful to say c equals a plus b and now you've got uh, c stored as well so in this way you could use model as a calculator Right, and there's other functions too. You can compute the sine of a number, say the sine of two, or the sine of pi. Pi is predefined. With so uh, this is zero uh, effectively, right? Um, because it's two minus sixteenth. Uh, okay, so this is using my black calculator, which is usually not how you use it, because you can harness the power of programming and write a script. Although you can use this command interface um, or a command window as sort of a, a prototyping environment, right? You could quickly create things here and test them before you use them in the script. So let's define a script. You can say new script here, new script. And again, I've defined that new scripts are listed on the left here, but you can drag this thing such that it's at the, at the top. I like them on the left, so I can see the whole list there. So we have a script, and I can say a equals one there, and I can say save and run the script, or hit F5. I tend to hit F5 instead of clicking the green run button here. But if I run this, uh, first of all, it's just like, hey, can you save that, uh, please? So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna put it on the desktop for the moment. Uh, here, let me see. Is this the desktop? Ah, oh, put it. For some reason, I have two desktop folders. Doesn't matter. I'm calling it temp. Oops, temp workshop. There. And then, if you run something, um, typically you run something in a in a, from your current folder. So I'm in my home Kevin folder. That's my folder. You might be in a different folder. And then I uh, hear it asks you, like, would you like to change your folder now or add this path where this file is to the current path where we're running things? So either is fine, actually, it'll make it run for the moment. Uh, I'll just change folder. So now you can see the current working directory is home, Kevin, desktop, and that's where I'm working. So if I uh, run this, you can see it produces A equals one. It kind of says here, from temp workshop, which is the thing we ran, A equals one. So it produces that on the command window. If you don't want to produce in the command window, you have to terminate statements with a semicolon like that. So now A no longer appears here. 
if you have a whole bunch of stuff on the command window and you want that gone, you can you can enter CLC to clear that, and now it's gone. Okay, it just washes it. It doesn't delete any variables from the workspace. It just means that this text uh, displayed on the command window is gone. So, but if I if I do remove the, the um, semicolon, it's kind of nice to be able to see the output of your code a equals one. But then, if you want it, if you want to start with a clean slate every time, you could put CLC at the start to sort of first clear the command window and then define what's happening. So now you can see it's a fresh start every time. It's not. So if I disable this, a control R comments things. So a percent symbol is a comment, and now this won't run. This you can write a whole novel here to explain code if you, if you want. Uh, so now I'll just turn CLC into a comment that doesn't do anything in, anymore. So it disables it effectively. Then if I run it, you'll see that it keeps being added to the command window, right? Now, if I use um, control T here, or if I remove the percent symbol, CLC is active again, and you can see it will um, always start from clean slate. Um, also, you can see B is still there. So in this code, I could say um, um, C equals A plus B, and this, oops, sorry, C equals A plus B, and that'll actually run, which produces the number three. Okay, but then let's say, I've um, I've left work. I've closed down MATLAB. Closing down MATLAB means that there's no workspace variables defined, right? So if I do clear for the moment, and CLC, this is kind of what it looks like when you start an empty workspace and an empty command window. Then can this code run? No, it can't because B is missing, right? It'll say, "Whoa, unrecognized function or variable B." So um, sometimes your code depends on what is in the current workspace. It's kind of not what you want, or it's often not what you want. So. To, to, to always start from a clean slate, I do clear and close all, which closes all the figures if you had any open, and CLC. Okay? Now, if you, wanted, if you wanted to explain to yourself what this does, you can add comments to things. So I can choose to put these on separate lines. As long as I have semicolon separators, I can actually have them on the same line. I can say clear, clears all variables from the workspace. So that uh, helps tell me, the human reader, what this does. So close all figures and clear the command window. Great. So, and then you notice me putting two percentage symbols. What does that do? So it kind of separates your cells into blocks or it separates your code into blocks. Um, and you could call these cells as well. Um, and by running control enter, it, it only executes that part. So if I run this, we have the same stuff as before. Now I can add my B variable and uh, call this little block um, um, creating uh, variables. Okay, there's an example. So I'll leave that. And now let's create a new cell. So these are numbers, single numbers, right? And um, um, that's how they show up there. Um, you can also create create arrays. Okay, so I could say um, D equals um, now I'm using square brackets to kind of catch these numbers and hold them all together. So I say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I can do control enter again to just run that cell. Or I can do um, this green button or F5 to run the whole thing. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now you'll notice the in the workspace, let me clear this up a little bit, you can drag these things around. Um, it says the value is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Its size is 1 by 5. Now it's more bytes because we have to store more numbers and it's still a double. Um, what does double mean? You have to look that up. That's sort of a computer science uh, term. Like it means that uh, um, it uses double precision. So like pi on the screen now looks like 3.1416, but you know it continues indefinitely, right? This is the default display of numbers with four decimal places. You can make that longer by typing format long. It's just, it doesn't change the performance of any codes. It's just that the display in the command window uses the long format. So then I, I can ask for pi, and this is actually the full state of pi as used in the computer with double precision. So um, that's beyond the scope of this um, introduction. But just so you know, that's why it says double. We tend to store that many digits for stuff, and that seems to be uh, sufficient for many applications. OK, so I've created an array. Let's run it again. Uh, that is a 1 by 5. Great, good stuff. And um, in fact, I could have shortened this. So you can see now I'm just creating a bunch of numbers in a row. There is actually syntax for that. So um, I could add a comment here, um, uh, manually creating an array, or vector really, right? Because it's a row vector. This is a row vector. But you can also code it straight away. So we could say E equals 1, 
Um, but now we're going to say in steps of one up to eight, for instance, or six, if I want it to be the same as D. If I do control enter, you could see that that's what it does. Okay, so we have, we go from one, in steps of one up to six, and it creates the array, as you can see, the same as we did before. Now, um, that's great. What happens now if I did steps of two up to six? That works too. So now we have one, three, five. Hmm, it doesn't quite get to six. That makes sense, right? Because if I start at one, add two, I get to three. Add two, I get to five. Add two, I get to seven. Whoops, that's bigger than six. So sometimes if this function is fine, this range creation, but it doesn't always, it does start at the start, but it doesn't always reach the end, depending on the step you've chosen. It's just not physically possible or mathematically possible. So creating a range of numbers using step. Okay, you can also do, let's call it f equals uh, lin space, which is called linear space. I can start at one, go to six in six steps. So now the first thing is the start. The second input is the end. The, the last input is the number of steps to use to create that variable. So now if I look at f, I go one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? I could also say 12 steps, and now it might be fractions, right? So this, because it is format long, um, these are now very long looking. Let's go back to format short and say what f was. Oh, by pressing up, I can retrieve former commands here in the command menu, which is kind of useful. Yeah, so f, I can ask, but what f? That. And give myself a bit more space. Sometimes it's nice to just be able to see a row vector as a row. Still not, still not enough space. And give myself a bit more space. Doesn't quite fit, right? Maybe I'll do um, uh, four steps. There. So you can see it can be fractions as well. So now it computes the steps required to go from one to six in four steps, or from, from any number to any number in any number of steps. So I've introduced creating a range of numbers and creating with a certain step size and creating a range of numbers uh, with the desired number of numbers but it computes the step size for you. So this is um, creating a range of numbers numbers by defining start and end number of steps. Great stuff. So now we, we know how to create arrays. Uh, so these are row vectors, right? Uh, how do we create a column? So uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Let's say G equals um, we could still say one of the six, but how do we create a column vector? So you could transpose it. So I catch it in square brackets, and then I transpose it using that, um, that symbol. So if I do control enter, now you could see G is one by six like that, or sorry, six by one like that. You could study the size here too. I should say that you could add other things here too. If you right click, I can say, give me the max value too. I want to know the max value. And you can drag these things around depending on how interesting you find them. Maybe you don't care that it's a, what the class is, uh, so you could disable that and add others. All right, I was going to say G equals is a six by one uh, column, and you could uh, see it there. Oops, sorry. Oh, what am I doing? I think I accidentally pasted something. There. There's G is a one by six. Okay, so now we have a column vector. Great, so those exist. Well, as you might expect, these are just six there's one by sixes and six by one, so you can also create six by sixes or n by n's or whatever arrays that are matrices. So creating matrices. So um, we can create a matrix A that consists of say one, two, three, uh, four, for instance, right? Uh, so I'm using a capital letter there. It's one, two, three, four. Good stuff. But how do you add more to that? So this is one row. How do I add a second row? I can use a semicolon to kind of say go on to the next line. And then I could say, for instance, uh, five, six, seven, eight, oops. And I have to run that. So the one, two, three, four is the first row, five, six, seven, eight is the second row. Okay, so that is a little matrix. You can make it square by adding more, right? So it's a nine, 10, 11, whoops, 11, 12. There's the third row. So now A is actually a three by four, let's see, three by four double. At some point it doesn't display the value anymore because it's too many numbers to display. So for small things, it says the value. Uh, but the max is kind of useful here. There's, um, uh, 12 in size here. 3 by 4. Great. So now we have matrices. So we could say B equals A transpose. So that works. Uh, B then is the same as A, but we flipped it, its dimensions around. So instead of a 3 by 4, it's now a 4 by 3 as shown in the workspace. So those are matrices. Now let's get to the next uh, part, which is indexing.
So let's talk about indexing. So the first form of indexing is linear indexing. Indexing, linear. Indexing. So um, I'm, as I'm prototyping and showing you things, I might periodically do CLC just to clear things off. Let's look at A. Uh, A has numbers, right? How do I get a particular number in A? I can use indexing. I use brackets, and now I have to ask for a particular uh, element. So I could say, give me the third element um, in A. So you could see, actually, this counts uh, rows first. So it goes one, which is the first, and then the fifth. Sorry, the first element is one. The second element downwards is five. The third element downwards is nine. So that's why it says nine. If I ask for the fourth now, That'll be one, two, three, four. The fourth is the next column over. So that should be the number two. Okay, so that's linear inde indexing. So that is, if I explain this here in the comments, indexing, whoops, oh my God, that's not at all. Indexing um, using element number in an array. Okay, so if you ask, and I'll show you some useful commands, normal tells you the number of elements in A. Well, there's 12 elements. Because if I look at the size of A, which is a command you can use, it tells me 3 by 4. Great. And if I use prod, which is the product of the size, so 3 times 4 is 12. So there. And I've shown in various ways that it has 12 elements in it. So that means I can ask for, I go up, up, up. Uh, I can ask for the 11th element, which is the 8th. Is that correct? Yeah. So it's like 1, 2, 3, oops, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 10, 11, which is an 8. That's great. And I can ask for 12, which is the last element, which is the 12, as we expect this. But I cannot ask for the 13. This is a typical warning. Like if you're coding in MATLAB, you'll very often get something like this. Index exceeds matrix dimensions or array elements. Um, now, that should tell you, oops, I'm doing something like this. I'm asking for a number that I can't ask for because that, that's not in the matrix. It's a 3 by 4. There's only 12 elements. I cannot ask for the 13th element. It won't grow it for you. Uh, that would be annoying if rows, uh, variables on the fly like that. Okay, so um, there you get that uh, error message. So that's linear indexing. Um, I'll just do an example here. This is um, the first element. And I should say uh, num numbering starts from the first dimension onto the uh, next up to the last, right? So you go uh, for instance, uh, rows, then then columns, rows, then columns, then, well, so if it's a multidimensional array, then slices, or whatever you want to call that other dimension, okay, and then comma dot 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 dot, as in like, keeps a uh, number, the first element, um, and I should say there's another useful thing, so the first is useful, but very, quite often you want to do something up to the end of the array, or the last of the last, or you want to find the last without having to compute the number 12. So there's a shortcut for that. You can just say end. What is A end? 12. That's useful. And that also works for these arrays. So what do we have? We have D, which was a little 1 by 6. I can say D end, in the end, please. 6. Great. Um, could I use ranges here? So I could say give me D 1 after the end. Well, that's just everything, isn't it? So I could say give me 1 after 3. So now I'm using this range specified um, here. And actually, I left something out. Um, this, the default step size for a range is 1, so, but if you leave that out, it'll just be 1, right? So, but I could also say, go, give me D, but go start at the first, go in steps of 2 up to the end. Then it gives you the first, third, and fifth element, which happens to also have those values. So I should maybe do um, D is D, or like the square root of D or something, just to create some funny numbers. So you can see that it's not always those numbers, right? But you can see I picked the first, whoops, the first, the third, and uh, last in this case right okay so now we can use end so a end provides provides the last element so here you can see when i ask for a range i get a range or like a, a row vector back so does that is that the same with an array so we have this matrix what happens if i say give me uh the first up to the sixth element yes i get an array back or oh, sorry uh yeah well a column a row vector back sorry so it's um, 1, 5, 9, and 2, 6, 10. I get those six elements back, but I've lost sort of the shape of an array, right? Makes makes sense. I'm just asking for a bunch of elements. It doesn't pour it into a new array. So um, using a range of linear indices. Great. So that's linear indexing. 
Um, what else? Do we, we have a subscript, subscript indexing, which is very important. So now this is maybe what people are used to in a matrix. So you have A, it's, um, uh, what was the size again? It was a three by four. So now I could say A, um, you can kind of use subscript, like um, I and J is typically the notation that it's used to. Let's say that the second row, third column, what number should that be? Second row is this row, third column, that should give me the number seven. So by giving two numbers, those are kind of coordinates into the array. So um, here, um, so you can pick out elements using the well, matrix indices, like, yeah, or coordinates. So it's almost easier to understand this than the linear indexing. You could specifically say second row, third column. Okay, so uh, can I say third column, third row? Sorry, third row, third column? Yes, that's the number 11. So third row, third column. Great. And similarly, if I say, what's the fifth row, third entry? Uh, that doesn't fit, right? Because it's a three by four. I can't I ask for the fifth column. So here, index in position one exceeds array bound. So read these messages clearly, and it actually exactly tells you what's going on. So that's subscript indexing. And then there's, um, you can convert from one form of indexing to another. So convert from linear indexing to subscript indexing and vice versa. Okay. So um, this is where I actually sometimes don't know this off the top of my head. So this is maybe a good point to talk to you about the documentation. If you go to home, there's a big question mark here. First of all, all the documentation is online, but if you don't want to use the online editor um, uh, help, you could use this big question mark and uh, look up. So there's subscript to linear indexing. So the first, let's do um, uh, int to sub would be converting. You could have also searched for converting indices and then this should show up as well. So uh, how to read it? Typically, to get a quick view on things, you can look at the syntax here. Um, and if you read this, I'm not gonna read it today, but it says row column equals into sub size and indices. Yeah. I'm just gonna copy this. I use control C um, and I paste it here. Okay. And actually, so it's up to you how to call these variables. I'm gonna call it sys for size and int for linear indices. But I have my matrix A, I'm going to say sys equals size of a. So you know, and you can prototype these things in the command window. You know it's a three by four. So um, so now sys itself is a one by two, and its numbers are three by four, which happen to denote the size of the matrix A. Um, okay, so now I have sys defined. Here's a really useful feature. Do you see what's happening? If I put my cursor on a variable, it highlights where it's used. I've changed the color to be bright green. It might be some dull gray bluish color for you the default uh, i'm not going to show you where you can change that you have to go to preferences and dig that up that's beyond today but uh, either way it should highlight and it shows you the rows here too that's very handy so you could kind of follow breadcrumbs to um, up or down where where a variable is used if you have to debug and find a mistake somewhere that's very useful okay so I've created the size of a and now i need some indices so let's say i want the uh, first fourth and twelfth element of a yeah, so, um, and maybe the, maybe the seven, okay, there. So four indices are there. Um, so what do I get? If I run this, it tells me, let's unpack this. So I have A there, okay, and I have my indices here, okay. And then what did it produce? It produced row and column. Okay, let's have a look. So the first index, this number one, is at position row one, column one. Okay, great. That makes sense. The fourth number is one, two, three, four. That's number two. That should be first row, second column. First row, second column. Great. The seventh entry, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. First row, third column. So I've accidentally picked stuff that's all in the first row. Um, so that's there, one and three. Now the last one's different. That's in the corner here, right? So that's the third row, fourth column, third row, fourth column. So now you have your column indices and row indices. Um, actually, I tend to call them I and J, so I'm just going to change that, I and J. So you can rename that. Yeah, do control enter, and you see now you have your I and J. So that means if you say, give me A, I, comma, J, you can use these variables as, as indices. Okay, so it's, it, it, um, it could pick out uh, these elements. A int gives you those indices, and um, you can pick those out. Let's say you wanted to change the numbers 
in those locations. I can say in those locations it equals five. What happens? Look, I've set uh, the variables in those locations five. But it's actually not um, doing it the way um, I thought I could explain it to you. I think a int actually um, is the better way of setting them to five. I'm just going to retrieve my a. So the, the a is now back. Sorry, right, apologies. I made a small mistake. I have to roll back something. So here's here's our a. If I set a int, and I want to change it, um, you can set it to pi uh, or to pi. Let's set, set it to pi instead. So now, now you can clear, clearly it stands out. So the numbers that I asked for before have been switched um, to pi. Um, and you shouldn't really use the subscript in the indices to assign it because I think it does uh, all combinations of it. Isn't that right? Let's let's test test that. Okay. There is a um, a i comma j. Oops. There. Yeah. So that's not quite. Um, um, that's not so useful. I'll get back to subscript indexing later. But it can be useful to find um, rows and columns using this. Oh, the opposite also exists. So from sub to int. In, instead, then you give it the size. So called sub to int. I could say um, i comma j, and say if the output would be in the. You can see that if you have multiple outputs, you catch them in square brackets. If you have one output, you don't have to do that. You can leave it there. Maybe it clarifies to you that that's uh, the output of a function. So now, does this work? Whoops. Um, you can prototype it here to check it out. Uh, one, four, seven, twelve. So you can see you can get, you could go back and forth from subscript indices to linear. So this goes um, converts uh, linear to subscript, and this guy converts uh, subscript indexing. Uh, to linear indexing, great. Okay, the last form of indexing. So we done we've done linear indexing and subscript indexing. That's logical indexing. Okay, what what on earth is that? Also, you could see that lots of stuff is highlighted in red, right? You might be like, why is that? Did I do something wrong? That's because typically you don't want to not have um, semicolons terminating a statement because that just spits out everything on the screen. So MATLAB, is kind of, if you hover over this, it says like, hey, terminate that statement with a semicolon. It's not really an error. It just makes your code a bit inefficient, but for the purposes of this workshop, it's nice that it produces things on the command window. So I'm not using the semicolons here to terminate things. Right, logical indexing. So we had A, there's A, um, and I can ask like, where where is A um, produce statement here? Let's prototype it on the command window. A larger than seven. Okay, and now would you guess a logical list? Let's say larger than two, larger than four. We want a bit of a mix there. Larger than four was good. Okay. Now, let me clear the screen, pull up a in that statement, so I've only that on the screen. So uh, here's a, and I've asked for larger than four. What you get back is yeses and noes essentially. So this is a logical array. Or William, you could see it. Uh, it has trues and falses, or yeses and noes. Um, so these are all not larger than 4, because they are either 4 or pi, right, in the first row. So there's just zeros there. And the last number was also pi, so that's also not larger than 4. The other values are larger than 4, so we have trues there. And you could use it, so this is a logical. So let's create a uh, great um, logic, logical uh, variable uh, or an array. You could say a larger than 4. And I can store that. Let's call that L. So now we can say L, my logic, equals that. And how can we use this? Well, you can use L as an index. You could just say AL, give me those elements. And it'll pick out the elements that are larger than 4. So use uh, the logical logical array as, um, as, an, as well, let's call it a logic, logical index. So wherever it's yes, we pick out that element. So it's as if you've used the linear indices uh, for those elements. No difference. It functions just like linear indexing, um, but it's just a bunch of yeses and no's. And I could have skipped the definition of L by just saying, give me L or give me from A where A is larger than 4. You could straight away type it in there too, which is more cryptic and maybe perhaps less human readable, but it works as well. If you're used to it, that, that can be a shorthand for it. Okay. Now you can convert logical indexing. To linear, and once you're at linear, you know, you know you can convert it again to uh, 
uh, subscript indexing as well. So int would be find l. So we find l and it gives us the linear indexing, uh, the linear indices of the logical int. So um, where's l? L looks like that. And it gives me the linear indices, indice, so the second element, that's correct, the third element, not the fourth, and then the fifth. So two, three, five. That explains that. See? So you get all your linear in the indices from, from this logical array. And then you could say, well, give me a int. And in that sense, it does exactly the same thing as this sentence. But now we're using, uh, we've converted them to linear indices. Convert uh, logical to linear indices. And that can be handy for some applications. Using the linear, whoops, linear indices to pick out elements. Okay, uh, what's next? So we've spoken about linear subscripts and logical indexing using find and converting between different index types. Uh, maybe now we're at a point where you can talk about uh, looping structures. I'm going to give myself a bit of space. I'm not always in the bottom of the, of the screen. Okay. Uh, when you use CLC, you can just use that whenever you want to clear this up and to try to understand something. The so four loops are just things that use indices typically or uh, a step uh, to loop over something and do something repeatedly. So I could say for um, people tend to use i equals one steps of one up to five. Okay. And I could just say, can you put the i on the screen? If I run this. It says, I one, two, three, four, five. Um, maybe you think that went too fast. We can put a pause in here, pause one, so that's one second, and then it'll produce I on the screen. First, let me wash away this stuff. So CLC clears this, and you can see one, two, three, four, five. And I, so basically how to read this, it kind of, usually code goes from the top to the bottom, but the for loop kind of goes downwards, back up, downwards, back up, downwards, back up. A for loop does the thing in it that I've highlighted in blue. So let's remove the empty line so I can highlight everything. It does everything here for the case of i equals 1, for the case where i equals 2, for the case that i equals 3, for the case that i equals 4, and for the case that i equals 5. So it keeps changing i, and it does what's in the middle. You don't have to use i, but the, the code in the middle could use i. Okay, so remember uh, our, um, what did we call d, right? d was a little array, okay, so... Let's um, recall it. There's D. Um, do we have a cleaner array? So what was F? F is F is the short one. Let's use F. So F is that. Um, now I'll, I'll show you something that makes code more human readable. I can start typing here, but then sometimes it's difficult to see that that executes in the for loop. So it's actually better to kind of indent your code. If you do Control I, it indents it. You can also use Tab um, to to jump there. But if you, if you've already written a bit of code, so let's say I've, I've gone like F of I. Like give me the i-th element. Then once you have this code, you can use control i to have it indent. So you could clearly see that's happening in this if, uh, in this for loop. So now I could say pause one again to, um, to make sure that the code stops. So first time this runs, so again it's going to go, it's going to run this lots of times. First time this runs, um, i equals one. It goes in here, and then it should pick out. It should just do this, right? It should just do one. Okay, and then the second time i equals two, it should do this, and the third time it should it should be that. So the the role of i keeps changing, and the fourth time it does that. Now the fifth time will be interesting because that doesn't work. It'll ask for the fifth element and it'll say index exceeds the number of array elements. Let's see if that is what's going to happen. I'm going to control enter the cell. There's f produced answer one, two, four, and a bit six, and then ah. Uh, so you can't do that. So you can't go to five. That, that's bad. If you wanted to loop over all the elements, maybe in this case, you could say no. Yeah. So now instead of five, MATLAB will first compute the number of elements in F and use it there. And now it'll always fit no matter what I use. Does that make sense? So I think that's cool. Um, it goes one, two, the third element, the fourth element, and done. It stops. Okay. Um, so now if we secret, not secretly, but if we, if we created a bigger thing, let's say, um, uh, one, one, five, nine, pi, and, uh, minus six. So now it's, uh, now it's five elements. Then this code automatically kind of is tailored now towards that array and it loops over those elements. Okay. Now, so that's, um, or loop super quickly. 
quick introduction to for loops. You could use them to loop over something. Uh, and you could use them as indices. So I could also um, for loops for uh, processing arrays. So I could say, um, let's override it by number five. So we're looking up the fifth or like the, the eighth entry into F and we're replacing it by five. So if I do that, then it'll say, you can see now it's changing them to, to, to five. Now five, 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 five. It used to be all of this stuff, but now I've replaced it all to five. And I can run this code again. We start off with one, five, nine, five, minus six, and it'll slowly replace each element then that one then the last one by five. Okay, so you could process things like that. Um, uh, vector, let's say vector arrays, right? Let's say matrix arrays. So we had our thing called A, right? So let's work on this. And now you notice something powerful. Copy, paste, control C, control V. That's the most important thing you should learn. <laughs> uh, my control key is usually the person to go on a keyboard. So I'll just copy this whole code because I know I'm now processing a matrix. I'm going to do very much the same thing. I'm just going to copy it over. Um, so does this work? Yes, I can put A in there. Normal A will work. So my code is general and I can loop over this. And now I will use the linear indexing again, right? So let's see. What was in the previous screen? A was that stuff. And I'm just going to change all variables in it to 5. So there, the first one, the third, the 9 is gone, the pi will be gone, 6, the 10. That i, that seven is going eleven, etc. So we're looping. We're using linear indexing now and a single for loop to do that. But actually, you could use two nested for loops. That might look complicated. Sometimes you have to wrap your head around this first um, to um, to be able to read it. So I'm going to use Ctrl I again to make it jump in. There we go. Um, the second index is now J. Okay, and I can do I can do comma J. Okay, so, and instead of normal, it's not the number of elements, I have the size of A, but um, the size of A itself is two numbers, right? So, A equals to 3 by 4, um, so if I say size of A, I get two numbers out. I can also ask for only the first size, which is the number of rows, or the second size, which is the number of columns. So I could say, let's loop over the number of rows, and also let's loop over the number of columns, like that. So that's the second dimension. So I can add instructions for myself, um, step or loop over rows, and this is loop loop over columns, and then I can, um, if I run this code, the initial A was this guy, um, yeah, then I can loop over A and change it. So first I equals one, so we're first going to first row. Okay, so this row. First i equals 1, and then what will we do? In that loop is all this stuff, right? So whatever is blue here, that'll happen first, fully completed. It'll be fully completed for the case i equals 1. If i equals 1, it is the first row. Uh, what happens in here in blue? Well, that's a for loop again. Okay, so what will we complete? First the for loop, where j equals 1, so that's the first column. And then we're going to increment j to be 2, 3, then 4 uh, for the final uh, case. So now actually we're going to go this way, this row, we're going to process that row, then the next row, then the next row. Let's see what happens if I do that. So I run that and I have pause on, so you can see that 3 is gone, 4 is gone, 5 is already 5, 6, 7, the 8 is gone. So we, you can see we're processing this array one element at a time uh, from rows first and columns. I can just flip this around, I can make this J and then use the second size, and then make this I and then use the first size. And now I've flipped it around. I can say column, col columns, and rows. It does the same thing in the end, because I go over all elements. Uh, so let's, let's run this. Oh, sorry. I, run the whole, I ran the whole code, so it's doing this one now. Oh, yeah, OK. Let me uh, finish that. So you can see now it's processing it in a column fashion. There, there, and there. Okay, so I flipped that around. So this is this is even um, this is an example of using for loops for arrays, but also I've used I've used nested for loops. And to come to the top to start a nested for for loop set. Okay, there, great. Whoops. So that's clear. That starts a new uh, block of code. Um, if statements. What are if statements? Statements. If statements 
are pieces of code that are selectively executed. Usually it does everything, right? Like from the top, Mata just runs this, runs that, runs this, runs that. It runs absolutely everything. Um, and so I'm just going to suppress the um, pause statements because if I run the whole code, I don't have to wait that long. Okay, so um, I used Ctrl R again to add these, uh, co to comment them out. If statements are codes that, are, that can be skipped based on a condition, so I can say if, and then you have to give it end. So the thing in here now is only run if something's true. So what is this true thing? It's a logical again. So I could say a equals, um, let's say two, and I can say if a equals two. So notice I'm using two equal statements. That means um, it's a it's a question. So a single equal statement to say make a two or make this equal to two. Two repeated equal statements is is a equal to two. It's a question. So let's um, let's first copy this out and put it in the command window. Know. A equals two. So I can ask for a here. Is it two? Yes, I can see here that it's two. Great. And I can say a is a equal to two, and it'll say yes. That's a yes, as in like logical. If I say b equals minus uh, five, then if I say is b equal to two. Then I say, nope, see, there's a zero. That's a false statement. That's not true. So now I can say, if a equals true, so that's a question here, then we're going to do this. So then let's say, hello, or instead, well, I can do that. Um, I ran that with complementer, and it produces hello because a is actually two. Or you could say, um, um, yes, a equals two. And it'll, it'll do that. CLC, let's clean that up. First, I define A equals 2, and then it says, yes, A equals 2. Um, now, that's an if statement. So, and what you notice here is a, is a string of text or characters, uh, which you can write um, like that. Actually, this is shorthand for dis, which displays this text on the screen. So, I can display the text, and then it becomes pink, and it recognizes it as a bit of characters, um, which is text. I'm not going to go into that today. Uh, so there's display yes a equals two, and you could also add else. So what if this is not true? So at the moment nothing happens if not true. It just continues happily on to the next the rest of the code. I can also say well if it's not true then do something else, and that's just else. So I could say else this no no sadly a is not two. That's sad. Okay, so you can see. Currently, it skips this code altogether, right? It skips that because that's not true. Uh, so if I make this uh, minus two now, or minus pi or whatever, um, so it's no longer two. So this statement is no longer true. Then, therefore, this this statement or whatever is in there is skipped, and we go to the else, and we will display no sadly a is not true. And there, no sadly a is not true. Okay. So now you can have you can have codes execute only if something is true. Okay, so that's the introduction to if statements. You can also have um, else if. So I could say if a equals two. Um, no, let's do a different thing. So b equals five. Okay, so if b equals um, equals five, then say yeah. Um, then uh, a equals a plus one. So I'm just saying a equals itself plus one. So we grow a. So let's first define that as two. By growing it by one, it should become three, but only if b equals five. Okay. Else, if uh, a equals equals uh, five, or b equals equals uh, minus two, then do something else. Let's say um, a equals itself minus five. So now, depending on what b is, if b equals five, we're going to add one to a. But if b equals instead minus two, then we're going to do that. So it's not just it else, else if it's any value, right? Like uh, here, if a was any other value than two, we did this other thing to say, no, it's not two. Um, but now the else has a condition as well. It's else if. Else, if, it's, if this is true, then do that. So let's have a look. So what we predict that because b equals five, a will be incremented by one, and this code is executed. So let's run this. Uh, a equals two, it said, yes, it is two. And then because b equals 5, uh, the next thing that happened, a equals itself, currently 2, plus 1 equals 3. Great. Um, now let's run this code instead for b equals 3. What should happen? Absolutely nothing, because um, 
if it's five, no, that's not true. That skips it skips the next line. If it is minus two, well, no, that doesn't happen either because it's three. So it should do absolutely nothing. So that's what you see. B equals three and A is still its good old two. We haven't manipulated it at all. I could also add another else to this and say, well, um, if none of that is true, kind of like the other condition, then A equals, I just force it to be zero or something. So either I increment, I could say add one to A, uh, subtract uh, one from uh, from A. Oops. Subtract one from A. And the last thing is, well, uh, make it zero. So you could see, because now B equals three, which is not, not this case and not this case, it's the last one. It's the other option. Uh, we make it zero. And you can have as many else ifs as you want. So Matlab just keeps processing them. Nope, 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 until it hits a yes and it does that one. So that's um, sometimes this isn't quite so human readable. It becomes a bit convoluted looking. There's an equivalent thing you can do using switch statements. Fully equivalent to if statements. But we could say switch. Uh, I'm going to use B as a switch. Uh, I spelled that wrong. Switch B. I'm going to say case one. We're going to do something like case that it's two. Do that. Case that it's three. Do that. Case that it's four. Do that. And what if it's something else? Well, just do otherwise. If this is the syntax to use. If I say um, B equals one, let's test that. I'm just going to clean the skin. PLC. And bring this back to the middle bit. Okay, so we have our, let's give ourselves a bit of space. There's nothing in there now, so it doesn't do anything. Right? If I run this, I'll just say B equals 1. Uh, it'll be this case. So I could say, if I say banana there, it'll say that because B equals 1. If I could say uh, apple, if it's 2, so now it'll say banana, because it's 1. But if I change it to 2 and run that, it'll, it'll say apple. So it does that code. So now you could have sort of a switch. And actually, I tend to call this, um, like, uh, let's say this was some code, and you say test case. That's just a name. So actually, this is also the first time that we've used, like, a whole, nearly a worded thing as a variable. You could make your variables as long and descriptive as you want. Sometimes it becomes less readable by having long statements. Sometimes it becomes more readable and understandable. Test case seems very reasonable. Uh, you could say, uh, this could be, like, test case, um, whatever, uh, positive numbers or whatever. You could have different cases for your code. You could say uh, negative numbers. So you could say um, A equals uh, 5, or you could say uh, A e equals minus 5, or you could say my test case for my code is uh, fractions. So I could say uh, A equals 1 by the 2, which is the same as a half, but there you go. Or the, what's the other, do you have any other special numbers? Um, well, a equals maybe the square root of 2, like an irrational number. Okay, otherwise, what is it? A equals, um, um, I know, 0, another one. So, okay, so now we have different test cases. And let's say the bit of code that I want to do uh, something with A here it would be like um, A plus 3 or something. C equals A plus 3. So, um, test case. So I could do a positive number test of my code. Test case, if I run this, um, so clear the screen first. First, test case equals 1. That means, look, it only does that code for the case number 1. A equals 5. And it continues on uh, to run. Because A equals 5, by adding 3 to it, C becomes 8. Okay, now use, let's use test case uh, 2. Now it's minus 5. Minus 5 plus 3 equals minus 2. So you can see you can toggle all these options. 4, uh, it's a funny number. What's the square root of 2? Let's remind ourselves square root of 2. 1.4 something rather, you add 3 to it and you get that number. Great, and now if I just say uh, 99999, some crazy different number, you can see it does the otherwise case. So A equals u uh, 0 is used, and C is A plus 3 uh, becomes 3. So let's switch statements. So now we're nearly, that's sort of the, the global introduction to coding in MATLAB and the syntax is used. Other things, like there's various functions that have been established that you could find in the documentation that you can use to make your code. I find that the most important ones are um, understanding indexing is the most key thing in MATLAB. Codes will be extremely slow if you keep using for loops for everything. Uh, so if you use special indexing, you can accelerate your code a lot and, and use something called vectorization. So here we have these nested for loops. But look, I used for loops now to loop over all the elements and simply make it five. Is that needed? Yeah, look at the look. So A equals um, 
let's uh, make a hill introduce you another command rend is random numbers and I'm making a pity by four so it's just a bunch of random numbers um, sure I could loop over I could loop this structure right and then make them all a but um, that is very slow usually crypt it's fast now because it's very few elements but it will be slow for a big application so the better thing is just to go um, a one up to the end equals pi boom in one go so let's um, let's show you an example of testing code right um, let's do a equals rand 3 by 4 so we do the same array and let's use something smart as well let's say n rows equals 3 so we use n rows so that's the side matrix that we create and let's say the n columns let's say it's the same uh, no let's say it's different. okay so n, n columns equals um, uh, 4 so it's the same as before. Maybe I call it n call for short. Uh, n call equals four. So now it's going to create a um, just this on its own. Again, I can copy paste things in here. If you don't like what it says here, you know, just not execute that. You can use Ctrl C to skip things or kill things. PLC to clear it. Okay, there. I pasted that. Run it. Okay, that's what it's going to do. That is what I wanted to do. Great stuff. You can also select things, right click, and then evaluate selection. That's F9. And then it'll run it there too, so you don't always have to copy paste. Um, and now it's going to loop over it. You can time code. I can say tick, and then I can say t equals top. And then if I run this, so don't run that for a moment. If I run this, it'll tell me 0 0.002 seconds. Great. Now if I make this 30 by 40, and uh, let's not produce that on the screen, that's going to be a lot of numbers. Then if I do this, you can actually look at it now. See, I didn't put the pause statement in there to make it slower. That took 2.6 seconds. That's crazy. I just have 30 by 40 numbers, and my super fast computer takes 2.6 seconds. Uh, that's because I'm using loops. It's going through this one at a time. MATLAB is best at all matrix operations. So something like this. Kick P equals stop. Just boom, set everything to 5. Um, let's compare the speed of that. Um, Oh, I accidentally ran completely everything, and I lost my tick or T. So, look. So, look, the T that we had before. Um, that's not produced this on the screen because that's actually slowing it down as well. That's why it's labeled as red. I'm just going to do one comparison. This code here runs in for loop fashion, and I can run it a lot of times, and you can see it's sort of. Um, 0.011. So it became two seconds because it spent all the time producing it on the screen. That's why it's bad practice to produce things on the screen. Um, let's make it a bit bigger. So I want to slow it down more. Let's make it 3000 or 4000. Run that. You can see now it's getting to an order of magnitude hundreds of seconds. Even slower. Okay, so now you can see on the bottom left here it's busy, right? I made it much bigger now. Okay, maybe I made it too big. But it's a good example. That's actually a fairly reasonable matrix size. There, two and a bit seconds. How about just set doing it all at once? So I should maybe recreate it as random numbers here. So I'm doing the same thing, starting A as random numbers, and then setting everything to five. And now it should be faster, because um, we're just setting everything to five. And then go. Oh, now it's slower because I'm accidentally producing everything on the screen. I interrupted it by going Ctrl C. I noticed my uh, mistakes, my my mistake. So, um, on that one's on. That took one second. So it's quite a large matrix. Let's do that again to check. So it's half the amount of time. But it can go. Things can go much faster. If this was a multiplication, if a equals uh, a uh, plus two, maybe it's a bit faster. It doesn't involve indexing. But it's one second. See, one and a bit seconds. Whereas the other thing was more than twice as long. Like, but these factors of acceleration can be much more than twice sometimes. So I can add to or do something to a, a whole matrix at once by um, yeah, just doing it like that at once. There's no reason to loop. Sometimes you have a good reason to loop, but if you can avoid loops, it's much faster. All right, so that's, that's that. Um, let's get to plotting. So that's a useful thing too. So visualization and plotting. You can create a figure, a figure. Okay, and do plot something else. 
But before I do that, maybe uh, I create x, and I can use, I can use lint space. I can go from zero to two pi. So we've, in we've introduced lint space. I can go from zero to two pi in ten steps. Okay, what does that do? You could either uh, use F9 to execute that here. You can see that's 2 pi. I go from 0 to 2 pi in 10 steps. You can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then the last numbers. Um, okay, and then I could say y equals the sine of x. Great. So we're actually doing the sine to each of these without a forward of 2. Like it's processing all elements. And you might recognize that as a sine, but let's plot it then. So we could say plot x, comma y. Plot that uh, on its own, and there's a, a graph. Okay, so there's the sine of x. Um, and let's do another thing. Um, we could say y2 equals the cosine of x. Oops, cos of x. There's another function. And I can also plot that. I can say plot two, uh, y2. And that is one graph. What's happening? And this is actually, I find this an annoying feature. It replaced the graph. To avoid that behavior, you have to say, um, hold on. I'll say it on the same line. I could have done it on a new line too. So hold on, hold on. So two graphs. And it chooses the color for you, which you might like. So you could specify the color too. I could say that this one is a red line. And cosine is a blue line. You can look up the help on these things to learn more about them. So there's your sine and cosine. They perhaps look a bit you know, like sparse or uh, jagged or ugly. So that's because I'm only using 10 points. I can use n points instead and define n as 200, for instance. Now I'm going to not lose this on the screen to speed things up. Um, but now you have a much smoother thing. You could see x is, a, is an array of 200 numbers. It's a real vector. And so is y and y2. And they're producing these graphs. That's great. And we could create a plotting handle. Uh, what does that mean? So we store stuff like plots. Let's call this the plot handle. We give this any name, but we tend to call it H something rather um, for handle. H for handle, P for plot, and one and two for plot plot two. Um, so what does that do? It stores something. And what is that? What is that? It creates some. I'm not going to explain this at the moment, but it's a handle, and it's it's some kind of structure that contains stuff. And you can click on it and it says like see all properties. And you can see there's lots of things in there. And what's there? Color one zero zero. So that's actually red, green, blue. So it's one is red, zero, zero means no blue and green. So that's for one of my plots was red. Um, and that could be R denotes red, but also one, zero, zero denotes red. Okay, so afterwards I can actually use that and to change something. So here's my WCLC and pull up my figure. Ah, I see the benefit of close all. Because I'm running this code, I'm creating lots of figures. Um, I run the whole code on zone. I'm just going to make this small matrix again, because otherwise my code takes quite long uh, every time. Go back to that. Let's make code on that. Yeah. Okay, so that's my one figure, and there's my handles. CLC. Pull up the figure. There it is. Um, and I could say hv one dot color. H one color. Enter is that okay? So I can ask for it and get the color, or I can set it. I could say green like that. Okay, so let's have a look. And there, now I've changed it from red to green. So you can use code to manipulate plots in more detail by processing the handle on the plot. It, it contains all the properties of the visualization. Great, and um, so green that should be the same zero one zero RGB red, green, blue. That's true. So wait, can I give it a special color then too, which isn't even available uh, usually? You can just mix it. Yeah, that's yellow. Actually, that one would be available. This is black. Uh, one 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 is white, so I won't be able to see it. Yeah, you can't see it. But I can, if I do half, 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 by dividing this by two, that's gray. Is that available? Yeah, that, there. Now you can see it. Okay, so you could change the colors of plots or other things about the plots by using the plot and handle. And that can get quite technical, so I'll get more detail on that and just let you play with that yourself. So that's that. Um, sometimes you don't like the proportions of the plot. So maybe you want this to look square. Well, then you can say axis square. And then it will be square. Maybe you want a grid on. Well, then you say grid on. And the grid is on. Uh, maybe you want this black line to also be around it. So you turn box on. And there's lots of other features to change the visualization. Maybe you don't like the font size here. So, um, then you can change the font size, obviously. Um, so 
you can get a handle for the current axis. So a uh, handle for the axis equals get current axis. What? What is that? So you could see handle for the axis equals get current axis, which is a command, and it gives me a handle for that. One of these things is let's have a look. No, font size I'm looking for. It's it's quite a lot. Font 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 size. There it is. So I could say get my handle and say h a dot font size equals twenty five. That work. So now I've changed font size to something massive, um, and uh, and there it is. So you could manipulate things about a plot in more and more detail to get exactly the the look and feel of something. Um, there's also something else that we can plot rather than a lot of lines and dots. Maybe I'll add uh, one thing. If I make the font size a bit smaller, you can have dots, dotted lines as well. So uh, they look like that. So now we can see the dots there. Um, let me. Oh, yes. If you just go help plot, you get the quick and dirty help here in your command window, which isn't as complete or nice looking as the full on documentation. So, where is the full on documentation? It's here. I can search for plot and go to uh, 2D line plot, and it'll tell me all about plots, all that I want to know about plot there. Um, okay, but if you want quick, you can say help plot, and you can see the symbols here for different things. Dot is a point, dash is a line, um, and so by doing dot dash, it's uh, you know, a dotted line. And uh, one thing that I could do, you could change things with a handle, or you could change it right here. You could say marker size uh, 25, now I have big fat dots. That's maybe too many to see. I'm going to go back to about 25 points instead of 200. And now you can see those dots. But if you like that, again, Ctrl-C, Ctrl-V is your friends. You copy that over to the other plot. Now they both have big marker sizes. Um, you can also change the line width. These are things you can discover if, uh, from the help or by going HP1 uh, line width. It's a half is the default. So I could say line width there as well. I could say 3. If you like that, you copy it over to the other line, line width 3. And now you have your custom visualization uh, happening right there. Okay, um, we can plot other things too. So let's plot some more dots. Uh, I'm going to create an array of vertices or corners or something called the B. I'm going to create some coordinates. Zero, zero, zero is my first coordinate. And I'm just again copy paste your friend. Copy this over. It's going to be roughly the same. So I'm going to create a figure. I'm going to hold on. I'm going to plot my points. I'm going to use the same stuff basically. I like that. Um, but now. I don't have XYZ, I have like an array that contains my XYZ. So I can index into it. We learned in that thing. Um, I did forget to mention one thing. You can use the semicolon statement to ask for all. Let's go back to A and really quickly. Whoa! Oh yeah, I made a very big A. Um, but then maybe, maybe that's constructive. Size A is a 30 by 40. I could say give me all rows first column. So you get everybody in this first column. Everybody in the second column, third, so you can. This could, the first column could be x coordinates, the second column y coordinates, etc. So I can plot those then. I could say, give me, plot all of the x coordinates and all of the y coordinates. And if it's 2D, there's two coordinates. Okay, whoops. I can use two for the y coordinates. Plot it as red line, etc., etc. Okay, great. So there's my one dot at zero, zero. Um, maybe I'll use black instead, so I make it k is black. You follow the help, you'll find that. That's my first point. I told you before, if you want to make an array, you can start in the next line by doing the semicolon there. I can say 1 in the x direction, 0 in the y direction. Now I have a line going from 0, 0 to 1, 0. Great. Let's go up, which would be uh, 1, 1, wouldn't it? Now we go 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. If I go to the left now, that would be 0, 1, wouldn't it? So I can go 0, 1. And this could... Whoops, sorry, I ran everything back to here. From here to there to there to there. And we have a little line feature like this. So this could be sort of um, if you're working on mesh stuff, uh, like finite element meshes or something like that, some computation technique featuring elements. This could start to look like an element. It has four nodes and the lines are connected. It doesn't quite close it over. So you'd have to add the last point again, zero, zero, to make the, the visualization close over. Because plot kind of expects a line. There's something better. So if I remove that last point, because I already have four points here. There's a better command to use, which is the patch command. Patch is something that is closed over as a little thing. So if I create uh, a face description, say connect my first to the second to the third point, um, uh, to the fourth point, right? Then I can say patch faces 
My faces are F and my vertices are D. Okay, let's do that. Then there is a patch. Um, so that, that's great. Then uh, what else? So now I'm using actually these faces. This, this, so these are vertices, uh, which are coordinates or do nots. And these are face, this is my face array, face array or patch array. And really, these are linear indices into my coordinates. So my coordinates are this. Here's my array of coordinates. And basically, we're saying we're building a face by connecting this node to that node to that node to that node. And that creates a little plot. Um, now, that was very black. It was difficult to see. I could say face color. Let's make it uh, green, a deep green. And now we have that. Um, so, you could, so again, you could process all of these with a handle to the patch. So, but you could code them right here as well. Edge color, edge color, you can make a red edge color. See? That's that. And I've forgotten whether it's edge width or line width to manipulate. Uh, let me look. I think it's line width. So edge color and then there's line width. So you could copy this here too. You could and then say um, line width uh, 3 or something. Now we have that. See? So we've got a little patch. Good stuff. And that's that. Now we could make another one. So let's create a box next to it. So um, I'm just going to use plot again. Let's say D bottom one and D bottom two. And then I'm going to do uh, black dots. And I'm just going to copy this bit over. P control C is your friend. Mark the size big. Great. Um, plot, plot those points as well. So you can kind of see those black dots. I'm just going to add some more. Let's create another element, which um, would be two more nodes on the right. So let's say two, zero. Now there's a node there. Whoa, -oh. you can see my element is stretched. Uh, so the, the axis proportions aren't the same. So you might like that if this is real geometry. Let's add axis um, equal. Now, now the proportions are the same. So it, it means that the u... Sorry, I ran the whole thing here. Um, it means that the units on the x-axis are the same as the units on the y-axis. You can see now it is a square as we intended. I've added this 2, 0 point, and now I'm adding uh, 2, 1 as a point. An extra point, 2, 1. So, oh, I, I ran it all again, sorry. Uh, there. So now we should go from, this is the first, I believe, the second, second to the uh, fifth point, isn't it? So I can add another face, say 2 to the fifth. What else? Sorry, I'm not done yet. From the second to the fifth, from the fifth to the sixth, from the fifth to the sixth, so five, six, and then go here from the uh, sixth to what is that? That is the one, two, third point. Third point. So now we should have two, oh, sorry, now we should have two faces, and they're both green, and they're, they're sitting uh, side by side. If you don't like this white space, uh, you could say axis tight. That shrink traps your axis to the thing of interest, uh, or to the thing plotted. It becomes as small as it can be. Okay, so now we have a two elements, and they have the same color. We can also give them separate colors. I can create a color array. Um, so I could say one color is, um, for instance, one zero zero. The other color is zero one zero. So now these are RGB. So this is red, and the other one is should be, we're going to make it green. In that case, if you're going to use an array for colors, the face color should be called flat so it's explain that later and we have to add something called uh, c um, face vertex c data so you can learn these things from the documentation so you remember it straight away and we're going to say it's c you might make a mistake here and fix it if it's... nope it's correct um edge color let's do a different edge color i'm just going to call it black so we can see that better so now we have a red and green square so now i've painted it with rgb colors right you could also have that depend on data. Let's, let's say the different temperatures. There's a temperature of, of minus 2 on the left face, and then there's a temperature of 10, or room temperature, 18 degrees Celsius uh, on the right face. Now, um, that'll be color map data, and that's called C data. C. And you could see that. Now, where does that blue and yellow come from? That's color mapped. And the default color map is, color map, it's called Perula. Um, and you can't there's only two colors here, but I could say color map um, jet, for instance, which is a different color map featuring that. 
if you're wondering how to color things down, you can add a color bar. You see that. Right? So it goes from red to blue. We go from cold to hot. So from minus something, minus two, um, to that, uh, which is 18 degrees. Okay? So there's that. Um, now I've shown you how to use lots of, uh, or like two faces. You can also do, um, let me just quickly show you an example for lots of faces. Okay? Um, lead that. So again, copy paste your friend. Um, I could say x comma y equals x 25. What does that do? That creates some x and y data. I think it becomes clear when you visualize it. x, y, comma, z equals x. Now, um, for sure, we could use the um, surf command. Well, surf is surf. x, y, comma, z uh, for that thing. Let's run that. So that's that. So that looks flat because we're looking at it from the top. But actually, secretly, that's, well, not secretly, that's a 3D object. See, we have the surface now. Do you notice that these are kind of patch elements? Uh, Marlop does everything under the hood for you now. You can't kind of see it, if you will. Um, you could say, give me the faces, virtually the color information of that thing. And you, you surf to patch. Now it's all up to you again to uh, paint the whole thing and control everything. So then I'm going to copy my statement here that I liked. Um, I'm going to paste it here. Instead of surf, we're using patch. Uh, what I'm doing there now. So what I see, size. So there's an error message. I'm going to troubleshoot it on the fly in a while. Since I did this, I think let me um, let me go doc serve to patch. Maybe it's instructive to show you how you troubleshoot something. So you have to give it x, y, z, and some color information in order to get the color information of the So maybe I have to say that the color is the z coordinate. Does that work then? Yes. I just have a very thick edge length, so you, maybe the line width becomes one instead. There again, there's this rotate button. And now it's the jet color map, but I could say the Parula color map, which is the default, is there. So you could play with your visualization and use different color map um, items. So we've used surf to create a surface, but then we use surf to patch to get the patch information out. So my F array is now lots of stuff, you see. So this could be the first element, the first little square, is obtained by connecting node 1, 26, 27, and 2 together. Great. So, um, do we believe that? Let's let's plot that on its own. Um, so, if I um, create f1, it's f1 comma all. Oops, one comma all. That picks out the first face, right? So I could just patch that fellow on its own. See, again, I copy pasted it. F1 on its own. Use the same vertices. A face color. Let's just use red and remove everything else. So I'm just gonna. Plot that on its own. Look, there's the first face in the, in the corner there. So F1, you could see that. Um, if I were to use plot, if I wanted to plot the points, so these are these are indices, right? F1 is indices into my vertex array. There's a whole bunch of coordinates now, a whole list here, which is the coordinate array V. Um, and if I connect V, F1, 1, if I connect this coordinate to that coordinate, to this coordinate and this coordinate, then I'm drawing that little square. So I should be able to just plot um, to visualize that these are indices into the vertex array. I could just say, please plot these points as, I don't know, um, green dots. Again, I can copy my marker size statement here and paste it there. Oh, it's... Uh, uh, Oh, yeah, plot doesn't work like that. You have to give it x, y, and z coordinates. All right. There's the x, and there's the y. And I'll run that there. So now, I can zoom in with this little thing. Oops. Ah, he's there no more. There. So you can see I'm plotting the node to that first thing. So now I'm combining everything together, actually. Uh, there's an array, which is v, which is, the, I can ask for the size of V, and it tells me there's 625 nodes, and they have an X, Y, and Z format, so it's 625 by 3. And um, I'm using indexing, because F faces array, the face array is sort of a, how nodes are connected together, which are just plainly um, telling us, well, element number one of this little first square is made up of the first 26, 27, and second node. By sticking those together, you can make a little uh, visualization. 
too many figures. Um, and you could visualize one patch and I could index into the vertex array to get those nodes out if I wanted and plot them and do things with them. And this is the basis of manipulating meshes and models in MATLAB. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this introduction um, uh, in the syntax and use of MATLAB for coding. And uh, again, the most important thing is understanding indexing. So.